Good evening, everybody. My name is Stephanie Rupp, and I am one of the co-chairs of the New York Academy of Sciences Anthropology section. We're so pleased that you have been able to join us tonight on Zoom, one more virtual event, but it lets us stretch our, our tentacles and our ideas across a very wide space. So we're so glad to have such a broad audience of people joining us tonight. Um, before I turn over to Ryan Raum, who will give our introductions, I just wanted to say a few words about the focus of our um, Distinguished Lecture Series for this year, 2021-22. In the wake of the pandemic, we really wanted to focus on the ways that communities come together in caring bonds, caring networks. So our, our theme for this um, academic year is emergent care and community. In the wake of our turbulent and abiding experience, experiences of pandemic pain and politics, the anthropology section of the New York Academy of Sciences will focus our 2021-22 program on theory and critique of forms of care, mutual aid, and charity. With this theme, we raise questions about possibility and solidarity in the face of entrenched social inequalities and racialized structural violence. With this theme, we honor three esteemed colleagues from our New York community whom we recently lost, David Graeber, Sally Engelmary, and Leith Mullings. We invite discussion of how communities develop and deepen forms of care for one another and our environment in times of crisis and under enduring conditions of suffering. How might care be reactive, adaptive, relative, and revelatory? How do emergent communities both on the ground and in virtual spaces stake claims to a future that expands or contracts in the space of solidarity? This conversation invites discussion of the politics of humanitarian efforts throughout the world in recognition of the reality that much community-based care emerges in the shadow of dysfunctional governance and the corruptions of neoliberalism. The global pandemic has highlighted the irony that care workers are often underpaid or even unpaid, their exploration, exploitation a symbol of structural inequalities accrued across generations. Against the centrifugal forces of capitalist modernity, what possibilities exist for radical mutuality in the future? What constitutes care as related to the social, environmental, ontological, or material? Rather than asking anthropologists to assume some kind of prophetic role, this series offers an opportunity to take critical stock of what tools and perspectives our discipline provides in terms of methods, theory, community engagement, and public commentary as we envision and imagine new possibilities for reshaping society. I would just like to add that we make a very intentional um, effort to include all four subfields of anthropology because each of the subfields of anthropology has something to say about these themes. And tonight we are very excited to be learning about how humans might build more positive social networks from our non-human primate relatives, baboons. And with that, I would like to turn over to Ryan Raum, who will be giving the introductions. Thanks, Stephanie. Uh, I'm really super honored and pleased to I'm be able to in. give the introductions for two really remarkable scholars that are gonna be, who we're going to be hearing from tonight. Dr. Silk um, is Regents Professor at the ASU School of Human Evolution and Social Change, with appointments and affiliations with the Institute of Human Origins and the Center for Evolution and Medicine, among others. Dr. Silk received her doctorate from UC Davis in 1981, followed by postdoctoral training in the Altman Lab at the University of Chicago. After an initial academic appointment at Emory University, she moved to UCLA in 1986. Uh, well, at uh, UCLA, UCLA up until 2012, she was a founding member of the Center of Behavior, Evolution and Culture and served as department chair for six years. Her research focuses on how natural selection shapes the evolution of social behavior in primates, with a particular focus over her career on the social lives of baboons in Amboseli in Kenya and Moremi in the Okavanga Delta of Botswana. She is a remarkable and prolific and influential scholar with over 250 publications, pushing 20,000 citations by Google Scholars Count and a widely used textbook now in its ninth edition. Uh, after her she speaks, she'll be joined by Dr. Jacinta Biener, who is professor in the departments of psychology and anthropology at the University of Michigan. She received her doctorate in 2003 from Washington University in St. Louis with postdoctoral training at the University of Pennsylvania in Princeton, and she has been at the University of Michigan since 2006. Her research focuses on the relationship between hormones and behavior in primates, specifically as they relate to reproductive success. She co-founded and co-directs two long-term field sites, 
um, one in Ethiopia in the Simeon Mountains Research Project, and that has been running since 2005, and a newer project in Costa Rica, the Capuchins at Tobago Research Project. And she directs a homeowner research laboratory at the University of Michigan and also uh, in Costa Rica at the Capuchins at Tobago field site. Um, please join me in welcoming um, you know, Dr. Silk and Dr. Wiener, and I'm really looking forward to hearing from both of them. Good evening, everybody. I'm really thrilled to be here. I'm really pleased by the invitation. And uh, uh, so pleased that uh, I see members of my extended academic family uh, in the room. So, so to female baboons are grooming. One is performing the grooming behavior, the other is receiving the grooming behavior. I apologize for the shaky handed video. Uh, not taken by a professional, taken only by uh, a semi-incompetent videographer. But this is the interaction I want you to keep in mind uh, while we're talking about the evolution of social bonds and baboons. This is what we see when we are in the field observing the animals. And these are the behaviors that we have spent collectively, me and many, many other people spent a long time trying to understand. And we wanna know what they mean to the animals themselves. And the evolutionary story begins with thinking about the evolution of sociality itself. Some animals are entirely solitary. They live their lives mainly on their own, meeting with members of the opposite sex to reproduce and then separating. Other animals spend almost all of their lives living in social groups where they interact with other members of their own species. Sociality reflects a paradox. So there are certain benefits that animals get from living in groups. These banded mongoose are able to uh, collectively defend their offspring who are there at the back from this snake. In some animal species, animals uh, exchange information that's valuable to members of the group. And sharing information is an important benefit of living in groups. And in some species, living in groups provides uh, benefits in terms of being able to defend access to pieces of real estate or to specific resources. But there are certain costs that living in groups imposes on individuals because they're conflicts of interest. Among individuals, animals of the same species who are likely to have very similar needs. So within groups, animals compete over access to mates, to resources, and they run the risk of contracting infectious diseases like these Tasmanian devils who suffered and nearly became extinct because of a, uh, a contagious uh, cancer which creates tumors. And we think sociality evolves when the benefits of living in groups outweigh the costs for individuals. And selection favors traits that enable individuals to raise the benefit cost ratio, to get more of the benefits and suffer fewer of the costs of living in social groups. Some of the traits that 
uh, enable individuals to gain more of the benefits, suffer fewer of the costs, are morphological. Things like weaponry, which enhance uh, success in aggressive conflicts, large body size, which also provides an advantage in competition. But the secret weapon uh, for sociality for some species uh, is social bonds. But social bonds between individuals provide a way to increase the benefits and reduce the costs of living in groups. When I began studying baboons a long, long time ago, uh, our focus was on individuals. How do individual females uh, behave in ways to increase their fitness, to increase the number of genes that they have uh, passed down into the gene pool uh, in future generations. And we focused on traits of individuals like their dominance rank, which allowed them to compete more effectively for resources and reproduce more successfully. But at some point, we began thinking less about individuals and more about the relationships that individuals formed. And thinking about relationships has really transformed our view of the adaptive strategies of female baboons. Baboons are an extremely successful um, lineage. They've diversified and radiated and now occupy almost all of Sub-Saharan Africa. I've been extremely lucky to study baboons at three different sites in Africa and to take part and contribute to and, and benefit from several long-term projects on baboons. So this would include yellow baboons uh, as part of the Amboseli Research Project, which has been directed for many years by Gene Altman and now directed by uh, Susan Alberts, Elizabeth Archie, and Jenny Tung. The Chakma Baboon Project, uh, which is how I originally met Jacinta, which was directed for many years by Robert Seifarth and uh, Dorothy Cheney. And most recently, I've worked on olive baboons in Lakipia, Kenya, as part of a project that was directed for many years by Shirley Strong. And these three species uh, share a number of features and have very similar social organization and behavior. They form relatively large multi-male, multi-female groups. So multiple adult females, multiple adult males, and a bunch of um, juveniles and infants. Females remain in their birth groups throughout their lives. So they live with their mothers, their sisters, their brothers, their aunts, but, uh, and they live in this uh, matrilineal social world. Males, on the other hand, leave their native natal groups, their birth groups, when they reach sexual maturity and this is an adaptation that in part prevents inbreeding. So as I said, we spent a long time thinking about females as individuals. But we realized early on that individuals don't exist in isolation and even traits of individuals like their dominance rank are influenced by their relationships with other group members. So female baboons inherit their rank from their mothers. And the process of rank inheritance involves support by their mothers and other close relatives when they're challenged by individuals, uh, other individuals in the group. So mothers support their daughters when they're challenged by other females. And that enables daughters to outrank everyone that their mother outranks. So the relationships between mothers and daughters and other close relatives were known to be important because they help females uh, attain and maintain their dominance rank and dominance rank is related to reproductive success. So we knew rela relationships were important in that way and we thought that grooming 
uh, help to maintain social bonds among females that were important for the formation of coalitions. So females, we thought, groomed one another as a mechanism to solidify alliances that would be important uh, for females in acquiring rank and then maintaining their rank. But we, we came to think that the relationships themselves might be important to females. And the work I wanna to talk to you about today really uh, builds on that idea. So we tabulate uh, the frequency of interactions between individuals. And here I'm showing you the results of tabulations of grooming behavior and association behavior, which are combined in what we call a sociality index. Uh, and at the left side, uh, are individuals with a low sociality index, which indicates a weak social bond or a infre relatively infrequent interactions. And then as we move to the right, uh, we're seeing stronger and stronger uh, bonds, which are characterized by higher and higher rates of social interactions. And this is a, uh, a histogram which shows the number of dyads. And so what you see here is that most pairs of females have relatively weak social bonds, but there are a few pairs of females that have much stronger social bonds. Everybody in a baboon group knows one another and everybody interacts occasionally, but there's some pairs that interact at relatively high rates compared to the others. And we've known for a really long time that there's strong nepotistic biases in social behavior. Again, you see the sociality. Social bonds, paternal sisters. So these are sisters that have the same father, but different mothers have reasonably strong bonds and so on. And these are true non-kin. So you can see that maternal and to some extent paternal kinship have important effects on the strength Uh, we, we wondered whether all social bonds were the same. We knew that females varied in how often they interacted, but I was interested in knowing whether or not the nature of their relationships uh, varied as well. And um, for me, as someone who focuses very strongly on quantitative analyses of behavior, I needed a way to characterize social bonds. I mean, I can't ask the baboons how they feel about one another, but I can look at the data to find out how they interact with one another. And so the data based on the sociality index is telling us something about the frequency of interactions. Some pairs rarely interact, some pairs interact quite commonly. Another thing we can look at when we look at the distribution of interactions within dyads is we can, we can see how symmetric they are. They could, relationships could be very one-sided or they could be very well balanced. We can look at how long relationships last over time. They could be quite ephemeral, friendly one day, not very friendly the next, or the relationships could be very persistent over long periods of time. And finally, we can look at the tenor of the relationship. Relationships could be mainly hostile or they could be more tolerant. And uh, we'll talk about the measure uh, that I use to um, evaluate this, but basically 
uh, we're looking at what fraction of females uh, interactions are friendly. So I want uh, to think about uh, whether or not strong social bonds have any special features. And one way of doing this is to use a fairly crude uh, um, category system to differentiate between strong, pairs that have very strong social bonds and pairs that have weaker social bonds. So I'm going to call the top 10% here um, what I think of as very important partners, VIPs. And then there's everybody else. Okay, so we have these top 10% and everybody else. So the question is, are, is the nature of interactions, uh, uh, the distribution of interactions, the stability of interactions, does that differ for females at this end, at the top 10% versus females, the, the other 90%. So first, let's look at the, the, the effect of kinship. So I've already told you that, um, that females tend to have stronger inter relationships with their um, kin than with others. And here you see that kin tend to be top partners. And so these are entirely consistent. It just gives you a picture that my uh, very important partners really um, uh, match up with other behavioral data. So in terms of bond strength, which is just a frequency of interactions, we see mothers and sisters are almost always top partners. Sisters are frequently top partners. And then there's a decline as relatedness uh, declines. When we look at grooming equality, which is a measure of how evenly grooming is balanced within dyads, one would be completely balanced and zero would be completely one-sided. We see that uh, top partners here in blue tend to have more balanced grooming relationships. So females that have that are top partners based on the frequency of their interactions also have more well-balanced uh, grooming relationships. And this seems to characterize both close kin and non-kin who happen to be in this top partner category. They're also more tolerant. So again, our top partners are in blue, our others are in red. And if you examine the fraction of interactions that are affiliative, you see that top partners uh, tend to have a higher fraction of affiliative interactions than others. So close social bonds, strong social bonds are also associated with high levels of tolerance. These relationships also tend to be very stable over time. So this is one measure of the stability of relationships. So we had data from uh, the same pairs over multiple years. And this is an analysis that we've done. Um, we have similar patterns in yellow baboons in Amicelli and chocolate baboons in Miramie. And we, what we see is that these top partners, these, these pairs with very strong social bonds also tend to have relationships which are likely to persist from one year to the next. So if mothers and daughters are together in a group, they are extremely likely to maintain a very close social bond as long as they're both together. So overall, um, regardless of kinship, the strong social bonds tend to be ones that persist from one year to the next. So close social bonds defined in terms of uh, the frequency of interactions have special properties. They're nepotistic, uh, they tend to be supportive, they're tolerant, they're equitable, 
and they're quite stable over time. So they have these very special qualities, but what does this mean for the baboons in terms of the consequences uh, that natural selection acts on? How do these relationships affect females in ways that influence uh, how successful they are at surviving and reproducing? How are social bonds beneficial to females? Well, one idea uh, that we have and we think is uh, likely to be um, supported by the, uh, and likely to be true uh, for baboons and is supported by a certain amount of data is that close social bonds may help females cope with stress. So what would worry you if you were a female baboon? Well, this would worry you uh, being uh, caught and eaten by a lion is not a good outcome. So baboons have a number of important predators and they maintain vigilance against predators, but predators and threat of predation is a source of stress. And they're also internal threats. So this is a young female uh, uh, name, uh, well, this is an adult female named Sylvia approaching a, fe a young female named Rosie, who's just given birth to her first infant, which is clinging to her ventrum. And Sylvia uh, intimidated all who knew her, and Rosie's no exception. So there are internal sources of danger that cause stress for females. And what we have learned from work conducted by Jacinta and others in uh, Moremi on Chakma baboons is that there's a link between the nature of female social relationships and their cortisol levels. So um, we know that field work is extremely um, romantic, but in fact, a lot of us spend a lot of our time picking up baboon feces so that people can extract really important information about the animals. So in this case, it turns out you can extract um, uh, uh, metabolites of cortisol from baboon feces. And it turns out that in Moremi, uh, females that have um, uh, tight grooming networks, lower grooming diversity, tight grooming networks have lower stress levels. And this is true when they're cycling, when they're pregnant, and when they're lactating. So having a tight social network um, seems to have some relationship to females' ability to cope with the kinds of stresses they experience in their everyday lives. And uh, during a period in which there was a very high level of predation on baboons, researchers in Moraine were able to take advantage of this to um, compare uh, the cortisol levels of females who lost here, lost is, is a metaphor for um, uh, uh, a euphemism for had a close relative killed by a leopard overnight uh, in a very scary uh, set of events. But females who actually lost one of their own key social partners, a close relative, suffered elevated cortisol levels compared to females who were there on the same night and who heard the leopard come through the trees, but didn't lose one of their own close social partners. So having a tight social network seems to allow females to cope with stressful experiences better, or the daily ex, uh, experiences, uh, the daily uh, stressful events better. And when you lose a close social partner, you're upset. We've also been able to look at the long-term impacts of social bonds. And this is because there are populations of baboons which have been studied for decades in which we can measure females' uh, long-term reproductive um, outputs. And 
in a paper that uh, I published with my colleagues from Ambicelli, Gene Altman and Susan Alberts, using the long-term data, we were able to see that females who were more highly socially connected to other members of their groups, so they interacted with them more in friendly ways, had infants that were more likely to survive to one year of age. And infant survival is a really important component of female fitness. Females who produce more surviving infants during their lifetime have higher fitness. So close social bonds seem to have a really imp important impact on infant survival. And these effects are independent of female dominance rank. And in work from Ramey and then work that was later replicated in Ambicelli, we also found out that social connections enhance female longevity. And longevity, just living a long time, is another really important component of lifetime fitness of females. So the blue line are the, uh, the most socially connected females and the red line are the least socially connected females. And you can see that if you're more socially connected, you have a higher probability of living uh, to a greater age than females who are less socially connected. So social bonds have a characteristic form in baboons and they have both short-term and long-term beneficial consequences for females. So the bonds that females form have adaptive value. They help females survive and reproduce more successfully. And in the years um, since those first baboon results were published, We've replicated those results from originally from yellow baboons and chakma baboons and in a number of other taxa as well, ranging from house mice to chimpanzees. And so this gives us some confidence in thinking that the patterns we see in baboons may really be um, not just robust, but really meaningful for understanding the adaptive consequences of sociality for individuals. And now I just want to circle back and talk a little bit about people and what we've learned, how what we've learned about social bonds in baboons and other species uh, inform our understanding of social connections in humans. So this is my daughter, Ruby. And uh, when she was in second grade, um, her teacher asked the kids to um, provide their recipe for success. And uh, Ruby's recipe for success involved uh, eight teaspoons of math, four gallons of sportsmanship, two pinches of teacher, uh, seven cups of kid, and uh, somewhere between uh, a billion and a trillion pounds of friendship, 20 ounces of cursive, 10 pints of spelling, and nine gallons of work. And that sounds about right to me. The pandemic, was a kind of global lesson in social bonds for all of us. So staying home, staying six feet apart was a hardship, partly because it disrupted our social networks. We didn't get to see members of our family. We didn't get to see or touch or hug our friends, and aside from the, the, the necessities of life, which you know Amazon could supply, Amazon could supply groceries, but it, it, it couldn't deliver the things we really need to thrive.
what so what I was going to do, and she's actually already given the part of the talk that covers a lot of what I work on. Um, I'm a behavioral endocrinologist, and so of course, you know, the part that really fascinates and interests me most is the mechanism. And she covered some of the work, and some of that work I was part of as well, um, which is essentially to look at the how. Um, and so, what I wanted to do in the discussion part was to organize the three sections of Joan's talk. So the first section was, what are these social bonds? Um, essentially, uh, these are nepotistic, tolerant, equitable, stable bonds with particular partners. In the second part of her talk, um, uh, she highlighted that these social bonds might actually help females mitigate stress. So essentially, how are these social bonds adaptive? And then in the last part of her talk, she drew this link between close social bonds and Darwinian fitness. And when we talk about Darwinian fitness, we mean you're living longer and you're producing more offspring. And so essentially that's why, why are these social bonds adaptive? So those are the three parts. And I was gonna flip it and start with the second one because I have a lot to say on that. Um, and then I was going to sort of move into the other two sections and pose some questions, not like they're more like discussion kinds of questions that I was hoping to get Joan's feedback on as well. So I'll focus on part two. Um, and then if we get Joan back in here, um, I can just pick up where I've left off. Okay, so we have this what, how, and why. So I'm going to get to the how. So how are these social bonds adaptive? And as I said, I'm a behavioral endocrinologist. I study the physiology of the stress response. And so this really overlaps with my research. And as we saw in the middle part of Joan's talk, close social bonds are associated with adaptive outcomes for female baboons. So as Joan indicated, this isn't some weirdo phenomenon that we see only in baboons. We see it for a whole bunch of species. We see it for horses, macaques, dolphins, mongooses, uh, chimpanzees, geese. I mean, the list goes on and on. It really is one of these cases where, like for the most part, wherever we see these close social bonds, it seems to go hand in hand with an increase in Darwinian fitness. So better survival for yourself, better survival for your offspring. But before I get to that result, I really want to zero in on the how. So how does this happen? And this is a real puzzle for behavioral biologists. Like, how are these social bonds linked up with fitness? You know, like, so if you can imagine that cold weather is killing you, well, do closely bonded partners give you more animals to huddle with? Like, that would be a link. Or if predation is killing you, do these closely bonded partners keep you surrounded by more animals? Maybe they can spot your predators, et cetera. So in other words, what's the mechanism by which having closely bonded partners actually leads to enhanced survival and reproduction? And this is like a holy grail. I mean, figuring this link out. Um, and in even more interesting is if we had perfect knowledge, do we think that it's the same mechanism at work in all species? You know, so, so that's sort of the question that I wanted to get us started with. Um, so Jacinta, if you could take a cortisol uh, uh, reading from me now, it would be very high. But you're my friend and you're here, so now it's lower, now that I see your face again. So let me just wrap it up. I don't want to make this painful. Um, let me just make two final points. Um, friendship's incredibly important for humans. You'll notice I didn't say that baboons had friends. And I want to, I, I don't use that word for baboons because I think they're derived features of human friendships, which are um, not necessarily present in other animals. Uh, one of which is that we find it relatively easy to create these very warm, supportive, caring relationships with people who are completely unrelated to us. And this is uncommon in other animals. Uh, and it looks like other animals depend much more strongly on kinship as the glue uh, to bind social relationships than people do. People are very nepotistic. We love, our we love our relatives, we love our family, but we're also able to have these very generous relationships with people we're not related to. 
And I think that um, this is part of a whole series of derived traits that, uh, that humans have developed, which are, um, I think of as uh, pro-social and other regarding, that we really care about the welfare of other individuals independent of uh, what they can do for us. So our relationships with our friends are really unselfish in a way that uh, relationships between um, baboons that have close social bonds may not be. So I, I want to make that distinction. But I think that the baboon data tell us that this capacity for developing close social bonds and for forming these very special relationships is built into us very, very deeply. And we've, we've elaborated on the legacy we inherited from other primates, uh, but we share a lot uh, with them. Okay. So Jacinta, carry on. Thank you, Joan. That was a lovely talk. And you did get through all of it, except there was just a bit at the end that we lost, but you picked up nicely. So thank you. Um, and also I've been studying baboons close relatives for 15 years. So uh, I always look forward to looking at seeing baboons again. There's always a soft spot in my heart for baboons. So what I was going to do now is to open up the question, open up the floor. I'm going to open up it, it up for conversation. And I'm going to start uh, with some questions of my own for Joan. Um, but in the meantime, feel free to add questions to the chat. Um, I think that some of them will make their way to my radar and I will push them through. Uh, I think that that's how it's going to work. Um, but Joan, when you had gone offline, I started just to fill the gap with the idea of outlining your talk. So uh, the, the what, what are social bonds, the how, how do they happen, and the why, why are they adaptive? Um, and I, I created, you know, I sort of set it up for this puzzle of the how part as being sort of in my own wheelhouse. And really finding that link is kind of this holy grail, you know, really understanding, well, what is it about that bond that then leads to this success? Okay, and I said that I'm going to propose one hypothesis or one possibility, and I'm going to ask, see what you think about it. So, and I know you've seen this before. So one hypothesis for maybe why social bonds are useful is that strong bonds, and, and I think your talk showed this, strong bonds deliver a general sense of well-being in the participants. So rather than some specific service like huddling or predator protection per se, it's more like this general service. These individuals appear to have lower stress. So if you have close social bonds uh, and with a focused group of top partners, you have lower levels of glucocorticoids. Um, and in, in your slides, it said cortisol, glucocorticoids is just a generic term, kind of means the same thing. It's a steroid hormone associated with high stress. It's high, whether you're human or primate or, you know, uh, or even birds and fish. So that all sounds good, right? Um, so we know that, well, we know this from lots of different baboon studies, uh, including the Amboseli, where we have like, 50, they have 50 years of data. We know that high levels of these glucocorticoids across your lifetime translate to lower lifespan, like you will die sooner. Okay, so on the one hand, glucocorticoids, glucocorticoids are bad for our bodies. They take a serious toll. But we also know, and we know this just from basic endocrinology, we know that this isn't totally true. So glucocorticoids and all the rest of the hormones that are involved in the stress response are part of a life-saving response. Like if we didn't have this response, we'd all die pretty quickly. Um, and we see evidence for this in people with Addison's disease. So these are people whose adrenal glands can't produce enough glucocorticoids. And because of this, Addison's disease can be a life-threatening condition if it's not treated. Okay, but it's not just Addison's disease. We also know from basic endocrinology that the stress response is, a re is really important for helping us escape from predators. It helps us migrate 1,000 miles. It helps us sustain pregnancy. It helps us um, protect offspring from danger. So this response is essentially a call to action. It's going to save us if there's a challenging situation. So this presents us with a bit of a paradox. Is the stress response a good thing or is it a bad thing? 
Now, in an ideal world, you'd prefer to not need your stress response. Well, not sorry. You'd prefer to not need to activate your stress response. So we all would prefer a silver spoon life where we don't have anything to worry about. So we'd want a life where our body isn't forced to make any trade-offs between short-term survival and long-term longevity. So for example, maybe high-ranking animals, those that get supplemental food, uh, animals with very few predators, animals with year-round access to water, no parasites, no disease, whatever it is, these animals have less need to activate their own stress response. So they're gonna have less wear and tear on their bodies uh, than the animals that did need to activate their stress response. So those with loads of predators, those with famines, droughts, disease. So you're gonna get you know, the wear and tear on the ones that had to activate the stress response. But that's where the paradox comes in. If challenges are present, you desperately want your stress response. You desperately want it to kick in. Uh, you need to mobilize stored glucose from your liver. You need to pump blood to your muscles and brain. You wanna increase your breathing rate so you can deal with this challenge. Um, you're not gonna get away from a lion uh, without this adaptive response. In other words, like who cares about whether you live to 75 years versus 85 years if you're killed right now by the lion? Um, so there is a trade-off down the line to repeatedly activating your stress response, but at least there will be a down the line for you to worry about. Um, so this brings us now back to the baboons. So as we saw in your talk, Joan, for the baboons, the loss of their key social partners was associated with an increase in glucocorticoids. And we also saw that having a diffuse social network where you have so where you have too many friends, you're just all over the place, no really good ones, that also is associated with higher glucocorticoids. Um, and, and this isn't some weirdo baboon response. We see this across the animal kingdom. We see it in the wild, we see it in captivity. Social animals find comfort in partners, period. It's known as the social buffering hypothesis. So this is the idea that animals can buffer their day-to-day -day stress levels with by having close social partners to interact with. But this is confusing because isn't living in the wilderness, there's leopards, there's lions, there's hyenas, they can all predate upon you. Isn't that where the stress response is needed? So shouldn't we assume that they need these life-saving hormones? And why should they seek to lower the hormones by bonding with partners? Like they kind of want them to be high. Um, <clears throat> And I should also add here that the stress, so the stress response is not some maladaptive physiological system that we just need to tame. It's a highly plastic system. Evolution can change it, you know, really quickly if it needed to. Uh, if, so, if it was a problem for fitness, it would fix it. So it's not that we're saddled with something that's outdated in terms of evolution. So that's not the case. So why do we see social buffering hypothesis at work in so many taxa? I mean, the fact that it's so widespread alone suggests that it's adaptive in some way or another. And I'm not going to sufficiently answer this question, but I'm going to offer up one possibility that's kind of intrigued me for the past few years. And, and it's not my idea. It's, it's just a bunch of things together. And, and it's actually really uh, mostly been written about in the human literature. Um, so I would suggest that for an obligate social species, so that's what's key here, like baboons, like humans, most of our problems probably can be solved to some extent by having friends. So having more eyes for protection, uh, having alliance partners, uh, either within for within group competition, maybe even for between group competition. Maybe we need partners who will cooperate us, cooperate with us to achieve different goals. Um, so even though mitigating our stress response when faced with a lion wouldn't be such a hot idea. On average, mitigating our stress response when faced with all the social stressors of living in a group, eh, this kind of works. It's kind of a good thing. And what's interesting here is we also see the reverse. So we see the reverse to social buffering, uh, where uh, it's essentially um, social partners attuned to the physiological state of their partners, regardless of whether it's uh, good or bad, like they're, they're more stressed or they're less stressed. Um, so the degree of attunement is even matched to the degree of closeness. So if their partner is stressed, their stress goes up. Um, and so there's almost like this matching of your physiological state. Um, 
So rather than just simply thinking of it as social buffering hypothesis, maybe a better way to think of it as like a stress matching hypothesis. So you should match your stress levels to that of your partner because two sets of knowledge about the challenges in the environment are gonna be better than one set. So maybe they saw a lion that you didn't see. So Joan, I was just wondering if you have any comments to add related to the social buffering hypothesis or this idea that this off the cuff term stress matching hypothesis or anxiety matching. Uh, I think it's actually has a name in the human literature, um, something related to attunement or something. Um, or maybe you have other thoughts about the holy grail mechanism between the two. I generally give mechanisms to other people who know more than I do. Um, I think that, I, I think the idea that your social partners can, uh, part of what you said uh, gave me this idea. I'm not sure if you meant it, but this is what I, I thought you were saying is, uh, or, or maybe, uh, maybe you think it has some, some usefulness is it if you can offload some of the, the costs of, of dealing with the challenges in your life to your social partners, if you have somebody else looking out for lions or if you have somebody else looking for social threats, it might allow you to um, not bear the full cost. So this sharing and matching of affect uh, might actually be of mutual value to individuals. And that could be a kind of counterpoint to, to, um, to what you were um, talking about. The, the, the why you get this sense of warmth and well-being from being with your close social partners is, is, a, is a really important problem question, right? So why do you find it more relaxing? Uh, Dorothy Cheney, um, uh, uh, who we both worked with and, uh, and, uh, and miss very much, Dorothy died about two years ago, I think now, um, used to think that one of the benefits of having these close social partners was high predictability. You knew what they were going to do. And you, um, you were able to relax because of the hot, the increased predictability of the behavior of your partners. What you're saying is that, um, or what another element of this could be, is that um, a worry shared is, um, what does that old adage go? Uh, 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 a worry shared is a worry uh, somehow, yeah. But it could be that shared, uh, is it enables each individual to uh, bear uh, less of that cost. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I think so. And, you know, I do think there are going to be very specific mechanisms that people will come up with, you know, like, oh, I have huddle partners, so therefore I'm warmer, those kinds of real direct links. But I think right. the fact that we see it in so many different species, and it's I think that there is gonna be some unifying principle that pulls a lot of things together. Oh, a shared worry is a half worry. Thank you, Stephanie. So I started with the middle of your talk, um, but I wanna now jump to the first part of your talk. So I would sum up the first part of your talk as close social bonds are nepotistic, tolerant, equitable, and stable. And as you know, I teach the evolution of animal behavior and we spend several classes talking about cooperation. And I th think some of my former students are actually in the audience here. I've seen a couple names I recognize. So cooperation is notoriously hard to achieve in animal societies. And this is because there's always cheaters who will try to reap benefits without paying costs. So we know evolution produces some pretty selfish animals. Um, but we also know that there are pathways to cooperation, and one of them is kin selection. So this is the idea that your full siblings are, on average, 50% related to you, and your kids are, on average, or no, sorry, are 50% related to you. <laughs> so essentially, helping your, off, helping your siblings survive is, and reproduce is essentially the same as helping your own offspring survive and reproduce. 
So we know from other animal taxa that affiliative, cooperative behaviors are really often, are very common among close kin. This is a form of kin selection. So Joan, back to the baboons, it appears that the strongest bonds are formed between a mother and her daughter. Uh, sisters take a close second. So this supports the idea that could be kin selection, um, but then all the other metrics you measured, grooming balance, tolerance, stability, these are all high for top partners, regardless of kinship. Kinship doesn't matter anymore. So we come to the point, do you think, do you think it matters who they form their bonds with? Is it that they have a close social partner who's kin, or is it just that they have a close social partner at all? That's a great question. And uh, really hard to answer with the data available because although, because there's a very small number of pairs of females that have very close social bonds who aren't maternal kin. So when we look at those relationships, they're just not very much to work with. Um, one of the possibilities is that some of those unrelated partners are actually kin that we don't recognize. They know, but we don't know. And that could be because they're paternal relatives. Um, and, or it could be that if you live in a world in which very important benefits are derived from social bonds and you have a physiology that's adapted to, uh, to that, and these social bonds provide these advantages, that relationships that might have um, originally evolved through kin selection might gain some momentum of their own. So if you happen to be a female who doesn't have a mother in the group and doesn't maybe have any sisters, maybe the physiological benefits of having close social bonds encourage females uh, to have a, a motivation to develop these kinds of relationships with someone. So you could imagine that what's built into the animal is a motivation to form a social bond. And then they look around. Well, here's mom, okay, she can absorb all my love. You know, I will just focus on mom and my sisters because they're hanging around mom too. But if I don't have mom and my sisters aren't available for one reason or another, either I don't have sisters or they're not particularly receptive, then maybe I look around and I focus on peers that I grew up with, or I focus on other individuals who might be available. Um, and you know, the, the, the fact is we don't know how those other bonds develop. I mean, so what we'd really like to know is uh, how do relationships develop over time? Uh, if a female loses a really close partner, can she really ever replace that partner? Mostly what happens is I think is that uh, females, um, when they mature, their mothers are likely to still be alive. As they get older, their mothers get, as they get older, their mothers also get older and eventually their mothers are likely to die. But at that point, they're likely to have produced daughters who come along to be their, their best friends. And um, I am using the word friends now, which I probably shouldn't. It's really hard to avoid, hard to, hard to avoid the temptation. Um, but it could be this motivation to bond has been built into baboons and partner choice is strongly influenced by kinship, but not determined by kinship. I mean, that's a hypothesis. No, oh, that's a good answer. I always think about that and feel like that there does seem to be a real strength in the friendship, oh, sorry, the bond itself uh, over and above what kinship can provide. Kinship just is the, the path of least resistance. Exactly. Okay, so another pathway to cooperation is reciprocity. So some form of reciprocal exchange. And we know from lots of animals that cooperative behaviors are sometimes exchanged. So I scratch your back, you scratch mine. And this is sometimes framed as a biological marketplace where like a commodity uh, or a service might have a particular market value and the exchange is really transactional. Um, so it's, it's kind of an economic way to think about these relationships and it suggests that these services, so anything like grooming or protection or food sharing 
that these services are subject to the laws of supply and demand. So for example, protection from a dominant animal might be worth quite a lot of grooming from a subordinate one. Uh, this framework does have the advantage of weeding out cheaters in the system, since you can just not interact with someone who hasn't returned a service that you provided. Um, and there is lots of support for this kind of, uh, for, for, sorry, for some forms of cooperation and affiliation in animals to fit this system. Um, so let's bring this back around to the baboons. Do you think that the social bonds in baboons fall under this kind of exchange? That again is hard to know. Um, I think my take on the reciprocity literature is that we originally thought that reciprocity would be really common and we thought it'd be common in primates because they um, are really smart, they remember their partners, they live in stable social groups, they have many opportunities to interact. But um, the, the, from, my, from my reading of the literature, reciprocity is limited to pretty low cost commodities so that they'll exchange grooming, say. And I, even, I think they keep track of grooming over fairly long periods of time. Um, whether or not it's a strong enough force to sustain the high levels of cooperation we see is not clear. And one of the problems with reciprocity is that, and the reason it's probably not very common is in nature, is that it's extraordinarily fragile that it, it tends to break down when there are errors or of any kind. So as a process, it tends to be rather delicate. And it could be that, uh, that real life in nature is just too noisy to support very much reciprocity in very many animals. Uh, that's a kind of theoretical concern. Uh, I think it's probably part of the story of in baboons that there is a certain amount of contingent uh, reciprocity. But I also think there's probably, you know, it probably is, you know, you know, like Ruby's recipe for success, you know, gallons of kinship, you know, ounces of reciprocity, and then probably some secret sauce that is about how the animals actually, uh, the affinity, the true affinity uh, uh, that they feel for one another. And also just the fact that they last so long, that they're so enduring, you know, through years and years. Yeah. That that somehow seems like more than just reciprocal exchange. Yeah, although, and that's certainly true uh, in, um, so male chimpanzees are a really interesting example because they form these very close social bonds and they're stable for extremely long periods of time. I mean, chimps live a long time, so you kind of kind of stretch the, the time horizon for them. But even, and what's really interesting about chimps is that uh, although kin prefer one another, most male dyads, mo males have relatively few relatives. So most close social bonds uh, involve unrelated males. So reciprocity becomes, looms larger for chip males maybe than for baboon females. But even so, I suspect there's something going on that, you know, is reciprocity enough? And, and is that really what's going on? I think we just don't know. Yeah. Okay, so the last part is getting now into the big crux of it all, the adaptive part. Social bonds have adaptive value. Now, most research on the behavioral biology of wild animals isn't experimental. So we can't manipulate social relationships uh, in our animals. So we can't see if it affects their fitness. So our work is correlational. It's not causal. So of course, this brings us to the question, how do we know that the causality doesn't go the other way? So I'm not saying I think this is the case because that would be really dull, but couldn't it be that really fit animals, animals that reproduce easy, they have no immune challenges to deal with, they have low inflammation levels, they have low stress levels. Couldn't it be that these animals just have a lot more time on their hands for forming friendships? So maybe the same genetic predispositions or maybe the same envi env uh, environmental advantages that makes them fit 
also makes them really attractive social partners. Um, so rather than the attractive idea that social bonds lead to longer lives, could it be that whatever gives us our longevity is also making us seek out these friendships? Certainly could be. Uh, causal arguments are really hard uh, from the kind of work we do. And my bet is that there is a pretty complicated combination of things that um, underlie individual variation in sociality. So on the one hand, we see that sociality varies among individuals and individual variation is correlated with fitness. The question is, what creates individual variation in sociality? If all you need to do to be, the, to be incredibly successful in life uh, is to have lots of friends, well, then why doesn't everybody have lots of friends, right? And um, I suspect that there's a series of things that contribute to this. Uh, one is probably, are you healthy? I mean, if you are suffering and uh, you have uh, some major health problem, uh, you probably can't afford to be very social. That's probably important. But on the other hand, if you have these major health problems, you probably aren't gonna live very long because a lion's gonna eat you. So they're probably not that, you know, how much that contributes to what we're actually seeing in the long-term data, I don't know, but maybe not. That's probably not the whole story. It is also true that we know that, that um, the experiences that animals have early in life can affect their sociality. So there's lovely data from um, Ambicelli and now data from um, my former graduate, Sam Patterson, uh, which show that um, the, the, the conditions that females experience very early in their lives, when they're infants, uh, are correlated with their sociality as adults. And of course, there's more mechanisms we don't know about, but we know that sociology adults cannot cause early life adversity. We got that arrow. That arrow can only go in one direction, okay? And we know it affects sociality. And uh, data from Lycipia that, that Sam has worked on suggests that Early life adversity affects a really important component of individual variation, which affects sociality, which is temperament. So females that had a worse start in life, uh, who experienced more um, cumulative sources of adversity, um, were less likely to have what we call a benign uh, interaction style. And in baboons, that has to do with um, whether or not they grunt to others when they approach, when they don't have instrumental um, uh, goals in mind. And, uh, and so getting a bad start is associated with being less likely to grunt. We don't know what the mechanism is, um, but we can imagine there is some mechanism. And that, and being less likely to grunt makes you a less attractive social partner to others. And so they don't want to hang out with you. And so you have weaker social bonds, but it doesn't, it's not the whole effect. It doesn't account for all the variation. So my bet it's um, your health, which is based on stochastic things uh, that you didn't inherit. The genes you have that influence your motivation to be social, your early life experiences that, that might shape your, um, your physiology in ways that, that uh, influence your interaction style whether or not you grow up in a group that has appropriate social partners that, you know, your mother and your sister's around. Um, and, then, and then the genes that, that, you, that you inherit from, that, from your parents. And I suspect all those things contribute to individual variation and, and that the causal arrow, the causal arrows don't all run in one direction and that there is some feedback and that the feedback loops will be complicated but there is some role of sociality that's moving us toward higher fitness. Great. Yeah, I, I, I like that answer. So the last question that I wanna ask this evening, it's a little bit more open-ended than some of my other questions. 
um, which is why are these long-term bonds in baboons so remarkable? And you have touched on this already, but maybe we could just bring it all together to end on this point. Um, so from a human perspective, we all have close social relationships with family and friends. And these social bonds among baboons might seem obvious, like course primates have friends. So do we, just like we do everything else. But from a Darwinian perspective, these long-term bonds are really quite unusual. and they're rather surprising. So I wonder if you could just talk a bit about why these bonds should be so unusual from a non-human animal's perspective. I have two answers to that. One is they might not be that unusual, but you don't see stuff until you look for it. And I think one of the lessons from looking at the literature that's emerged in the last 15 or 20 years is that um, these relationships have appeared in places we had not previously thought to look. And that the kind of work that primatologists do uh, is not widely done outside of primatology. And so uh, the ability to, to detect these effects was limited because people just didn't have the data. So maybe these relationships aren't that unusual after all. I, on the other hand, I think that the, I think what's important about the relationships and what makes them important for thinking about people is that they emphasize the benefits derived from cooperative social relationships. And humans are a super cooperative species. So if you look at, at a lot of other animals, um, you see a lot more competition, a lot more overt uh, aggression, which is really pretty rare in human societies. We can get uh, Sarah Hurdy's favorite example is you can get all these people on an airplane and uh, everybody behaves nicely, usually anyway. They sit there, they put their seatbelt on, they don't smoke. Um, you know, when people tell them to put their seat belt, the, put their seats upright, they do all this stuff. You know, you can't get a bunch of baboons to behave like that on an airplane. And so I think that it, it reinforces the importance of cooperation in human social lives and suggests that it's not a completely de novo derived trait. So that I think is important. Um, and I think it's all about the kind of relative importance of these different dimensions of social relationships. So baboons cooperate because they have to compete for things. Uh, cooperation is rooted in competition. And that is sort of a, a kind of yin yang. Uh, they don't exist in isolation and can only understand them thinking about them together. So I guess what I think is important about this, all this work on social bonds is it's uh, reminded us about the fact that there are different possible solutions to, to problems posed by competition for various kinds of resources. You can do it by fighting, you can do it by cooperating. Well, thank you. I just wanna read uh, William Mitchell's comment. Uh, he said, as for causality, why should it be either or, or? It can also be a positive feedback loop where fit individuals attract social bonds, but social bonds foster fitness going round and round, which I think is, off, is what you had uh, answered as well. So thank you for that. But I think, if anyone else has any other questions, feel free to put them in the chat. I, I actually do have a question. Um, if there aren't any other questions, I'm gonna wait for a second to see. There seems to be such a divergence among baboons between the males and the females in how they deal with social relationships. And I just wonder if you could comment a little bit on, on that, that really sharp separation of males and females and what that has to do with like when you do your fecal sampling can you identify if the stool is male or female and I mean I suppose you can right 
sorry, I, this is a very social science side of anthropology asking that question. I realized how dumb that was as that came out of my mouth. But but how do you how do you make sense of that really sharp differentiation between male and female baboons in the ways that they create social relations and in the ways they curate them, right? Do they like if the males go off on their own and have to reintegrate themselves into new or shape new family groups with females that they're not related to, how do the males go about curating their social relationships so that they have their approach to sociality has adaptive advantage for the males, which might look completely different from the adaptive strategies of females in terms of their social relationships? Well, if we had another hour, <laughs> Seminar I could give on male female relationships in baboons. Um, I think that we have traditionally thought that social bonds uh, are not very important for males, but baboons are, um, these species of baboons uh, are all have these extremely interesting uh, relationships with uh, pregnant and lactating females. And they, uh, and these have been studied for many years. And what we now sort of understand about these relationships is that they're a form of joint parental care. So a male uh, mates with a female, a male sires a female's infant, that male is likely to form a special relationship with the female when she's pregnant. And that relationship carries over into uh, after the infant is born and sometimes for some time after the infant is actually weaned. And these relationships are very important to both males and females. Um, Male-male relationships in uh, these three species of baboons are weak and mainly um, antagonistic, but there's um, a species of baboon called um, guinea baboons, papio papio, and males uh, have stronger bonds than, uh, than females do. So males are, um, male social relationships are not simply competitive. It depends very much on the context and what particular species you know, you're thinking about. Jacinta, do you wanna add about what we know about male sociality and, and physiology? Sure. Uh, I also just wanna add that it does, not always, but it does seem like the bonds that we're talking about are in the the species, the sex that remains local. So the ones that don't migrate are the one or disperse are the ones that form the bond. So in chimpanzees, it's the males. Um, you know, I, it's not that females don't form bonds, but we don't have that much data on that. And it's they're they're definitely more difficult to study. In baboons, it's the females. So uh, that's part of how you know the difference that we see. Uh, with the fecal, with respect to fecal samples, we get them from known animals, so we know we're following the individual. So we know we don't collect fecal samples unless we know who it is, who it's from, because um, they uh, just because it, it most valuable when we know the animal that has just produced it. Uh, however, we would know if we measured estrogen or testosterone in a second. We'd know if it was a female or a male, given the the differences um, in these metabolites that that show up in the feces. Uh, but we would never use the hormones as a diagnostic of who it would be from. Um, uh, and in terms of like levels of stress, like, you know, in general, um, there's different things that we look at. The differences in stress levels among closely bonded partners versus non-closely bonded partners, that's such a really, uh, that's a difficult thing to measure unless you have massive amounts of samples. Um, uh, but the, we see the same relationships, you know, so the, the same things that Joan was presenting on the baboons, uh, we see inklings of that in other species that have these bonds as well, um, with the same kinds of patterns. This has been such a productive conversation. I'm so grateful. Um, I see lots of compliments and, and gratitude expressed in the chat. Um, I feel like I've got lots and lots of other tests and Sam is here. Sam, I, we put your, your, recent article into the chat. I um, it's, lo it's lovely to have so many people here. Um, I think that we should show our appreciation to Joan and to Jacinta for um, such an engaging conversation. Um, 
the visual claps, the emoji ah. claps, the, or the audio claps. Thank you so much for being here. And Joan, thank you so much for battling through the tech issues. I know how stressful that can be. It was. Um, Took years off my life, I'm sure. I know. I'm so oh. sorry. And thank you to everyone for your patience and for being part of this conversation. Our next talk is on December 6th when we will welcome David Carballo to present his work on urban infrastructure and resiliency in ancient Mesoamerica. Um, so we invite everyone to come back and join us again for another talk um, as we move to our subfield of archeology, span looking at social re resiliency and urban infrastructure in ancient times. So thanks again to Joan and to Jacinta and be well, be safe and take care of everyone in your troop and we'll see you all again in early December.